We uh, are now moving to our keynote address, and our speaker today is Admiral Dennis Blair. He is our chairman and CEO at Sasakao USA, and has been uh, at Sasakao now for almost a year, and has, uh, over the course of that year, has dramatically increased the activities and staff and all the things that, that Sasakao USA has been doing. Uh, and so, uh, has a few thoughts on, on some of the things we've been discussing today, so I'd like to turn things over to Admiral Blair. Well, thanks very much to all of you who uh, are spending your, spending your morning with us. I think it was a tremendous uh, couple of presentations, and even those of us who have been around these issues for a long time have uh, picked up new insights, uh, new, I new ideas. And it's also good to be here at a, uh, an event that symbolizes the arrival of spring in, in Washington with the Cherry, Cherry Blossoms Festivals. So I'd like to make a few uh, comments based on what we've heard this morning. We heard from Bruce Stokes about the high degree of respect and trust. And let's see, what, what do you say, Sora? Should we swap it out? Okay, is this one any better? No. I'm told to give it time. Hmm. Oh, maybe it's working. Have we, have we pulled a fuse on the entire sound system? No, it's not there. Not that one, huh? Oh, this one's working. <laughs> when you're involved in a naval accident and there's a choice between equipment and operator error, it's generally operator error. <laughs> so. But so Bruce Stokes gave us an idea of the uh, high degree of respect and trust between the citizens of Japan and the United States. Satu LeMay told us about the deep financial, business, trade, travel ties between the country, over a billion dollars spent every year by Japanese tourists in five different American states, 39,000 employees of Japanese companies in Illinois, California exporting over $20 billion to Japan. And then this all takes place here at the Cherry Blossom Festival, which highlights the cultural ties between the two countries dating back more than a century. So the ties between the world's two most prosperous democracies are positive, complex, and of long standing. There are even associations in natural events, like the arrival of spring here in Washington. Uh, for years, the tree that marked the, the end of winter here was the shad bush, and its blooming coincided with the arrival of the shad, which was a fish that spent most of its life in the ocean, then in huge numbers ran up the great rivers of the east coast of the United States, including the Potomac, to spawn. And it was the shad that often provided the first fresh meat of the year to both the Native Americans and to new settlers after the winter had made the game scarce. Now the shad are running again in recent years, now that the rivers have been cleaned up, and we'll be seeing shadberries soon in this town. But now it's the cherry tree that seems to mark the arrival of spring for many of us. And instead of the shad bringing fresh meat to hungry settlers, the tourists bring fresh income to hungry local merchants. So <laughs> traditions change, traditions stay the same, and somehow the interaction between Japan and the United States weaves into native customs. Now, the individual findings of the poll results that you heard this morning are, are fascinating. We discussed uh, many, of, many of them with our, our tremendous uh, panelists as we did some of these facts about what Japanese commerce means to the U United States. And this overall relationship, we, as we said several times, is strong, positive, and deep. It's also of long standing. It was over. It was about 100 years ago that these cherry trees were given to the United States as an act of friendship from Japan. And the U.S.-Japan relationship has been generally been positive on both sides during all this time, with several notable exceptions. 
In the United States, there was the period of anti-Japanese sentiment in the 1920s, leading to the immigration law of 1924 that restricted Japanese immigration, that imposed many restraints and prohibitions on Japanese who were already in this country. And during the war, the United States interned Japanese American citizens in camps with, without any due process or recourse. On the other side, Japan's military regime in the 1930s saw the United States as the chief obstacle to its ambition, ambitions, its expansion in Asia, and eventually attacked the United States in 1941 in an attempt to drive the United States out of East, East Asia. However, following that war, beginning 70 years ago now, a strong U.S.-Japan alliance formed that has continued and even strengthened, I would say, to this, to this day. One thing that has always been remarkable to me is how close this relationship has been despite the enormous difference in our national characters. In fact, I think it would be difficult to find two peoples of major countries that are more different than Americans and Japanese. And there was a very interesting small book on, on the subject that was first published before World War II and then updated after the war. And the book is entitled We Japanese. It was commissioned by the managing director of the Fujia Hotel in Hakone to try to explain to Western American visitors the true nature of Japan to put in perspective the things that they would see around them. And there's a wonderful chapter in the book called Topsy Turvydom that begins with these words. It is often remarked that Japanese do things in ways directly opposite to those of a foreigner. To the Japanese, foreign, foreign ways appear equally unaccountable. Now, some of the examples that this book gave were serious cultural differences that showed up in many cases in language differences. This book pointed out at that time that there were no words in the Japanese language which exactly expressed the same meaning as the terse English yes and no. And then there were humorous examples. A Westerner was said to stir his tea, quote, in the same way the hands of a watch move, whereas the Japanese do it in the reverse way, even though they live in the same northern hemisphere. Now, when I read through these observations, discussed them with uh, some, of the, some of those in our office who are either grew up in Japan or, or have lived there. Uh, what I found was there were some, some of them they recognized where they came from, others, others they said, oh no, that's not, that's not true anymore. And I think this combination of, uh, of the legacy of the past thinking, the layers of new thinking which have come as we've had greater contact with the, each other are constantly forming and reforming in the U.S. in the U.S. Japan relationship, and if you step back and and look hard, I think you see more progress than you see moving back. But nonetheless, I think at heart, Americans are open, informal, and direct. And there's a strain of the Japanese character that is private, observes the rules of behavior, and is often very indirect. So, what is the strong basis of this? What is the basis of this strong relationship that has endured for generations, since it's certainly not based on cultural affinity as it is with, say, the United Kingdom, which we've had several references to the, the day. Now, as the Cherry Blossom Festival reminds us every year, there's certainly strong cultural interest between the United States and Japan. Popular American culture fascinates some Japanese, music, clothes, and so on. Japanese culture, both traditional and contemporary, catches the attention of many Americans. Woodblock prints, food, manga, anime. These attractions, however, are more the attraction of the exotic, the different between two countries and cultures, rather than the familiar, the, si the similar. The one cultural area that is common between the United States and Japan is, of course, baseball, as Ambassador Schieffer referred. Same rules, after all, nine men on a team, nine innings in a game, three outs in an inning, four balls in a walk, th three strikes and a strikeout. However, on closer inspection, I would say the differences between how the game is played on the two sides of the Pacific are quite as striking as the similarities. In the United States, building a team around the qualities of individual players, Japanese training and molding of individuals to fit into precisely defined positions and, and role and role playing. 
U.S. fans heckling of individual players on the other team from the bleachers in very personal and direct fashion. Japanese chants, songs, and flags waving in the stands. U.S. brushbacks and bench-clearing brawls. Japanese team's stoic discipline in the face of adversity. Same game, different approaches. So although the cultural attractions between the United States and Japan are many and they're strong, I don't think they can account for the strong ties between our two countries. And neither can the explanation be found in the influence of Japanese ethnic groups in the United States, as is true for other nationalities, famously from the Irish through the Jews. Japanese Americans are in fact the smallest ethnic group from among the major American countries. According to the 2010 census, citizens of Chinese heritage were the largest single group of ethnic Americans from major Asian countries followed by Filipino Americans, Indian Americans, Vietnamese Americans, Korean Americans, and then Japanese Americans. And Japanese Americans are among the least politically active of the ethnic groups in this country, with the possible exception of Hawaiian politics, where they play a very strong, strong role. By the way, going the other direction, Americans are only the fifth largest group of foreigners who live in Japan, according to the latest statistics. So what is it that has kept this relationship, this alliance together all these years, 70 of which have been an alliance that we have referred to? I think I would come back to the central role of shared values. Shared values, but different interpretations. As, I, as the examples I gave earlier demonstrated, these shared values are not easily discerned on the surface, and they are not across the board, but nonetheless, they have brought our countries together over the decades, over the decades since Japan opened to the outside world in the Meiji era, since the United States became a powerful Asia country in the 1890s. And one shared value is the common belief in the importance of technological progress, along with well-developed technological prowess. Alongside their veneration of the past and their wish to preserve it, Japanese also believe in the value and importance of newer and better devices. They have an inherent progressive problem-solving approach. In the past, much of Japanese technological progress was imitation, importing the best technology from foreign countries. That certainly was the early Meiji approach. However, if some of the basic technology was imported, the Japanese often reworked, improved, and perfected it far beyond the achievements of its originators. The Japanese automobile industry famously learned to build better, less expensive cars than those from the United States, and Detroit had to go back to school to learn the lessons from the Japanese continuous improvement processes. Japanese railroad trains were originally imported from abroad, but today Japan sells high-speed train technology back into countries that had developed railroads much earlier. And in Japan, many areas have gone far beyond importing and perfecting to discovering and inventing. Casio is given credit for the electronic calculator in 1957. Many Japanese com companies were selling them by the 70s. Seiko, the first quartz wristwatch in 1969. Sony, for many years, was a powerhouse of inventiveness from the CD to the digital camera to the Walkman. And most important of all, of course, Japan invented the automatic electric rice cooker. <laughs> we just used ours last, last weekend. And in this century, J Japanese scholars have won Nobel Prizes in chemistry and physics for the mathematics of subatomic particles, the discovery of fundamental processes of photosynthesis, and the discovery of the science that led to the LED, the liquid emitting diode. And these are certainly characteristics that are shared with the way that America approaches technology and technological progress. Now, another powerful uniting force, which we've talked about some in this conference, has been the shared value of common threats from other countries. And during the Cold War, the United States and Japan certainly were united by the shared threat from the Soviet Union. But again, with a difference, because so too, of course, were the countries of Western Europe and the United States. But on the two sides of the Eurasian continent, the forms of the alliance to deter the threat from the Soviet Union developed quite differently. In Europe, the key component of the NATO treaty is Article 5, and it reads, the parties agree 
that an armed attack against one or more of them in Europe or North America shall be considered an attack against them all. They agree that each of them will assist the party or parties so attacked by taking action as it deemed necessary, including the use of armed force to restore and maintain the security of the North Atlantic area. Now, the U.S.-Japan Alliance Treaty also has an Article 5, and it reads as follows. Each party recognizes that an armed attack against either party in the territories under the administration of Japan would be dangerous to its own peace and safety and declares that it would act to meet the common danger in accordance with its constitutional provisions and processes. In other words, as we've heard from Ambassador Schieffer, an attack on Japan would cause the United States to meet the common danger, but there is no reciprocal obligation for Japan to respond to an attack on the United States. And the next article of the treaty states that Japan will provide bases in, for American forward deployed forces in the treaty. So the security treaty with Japan is more limited, more transactional, and less balanced than was the, the NATO treaty. However, however, despite this imbalance, the U.S.-Japan treaty has a depth and a strength that has actually made the transition from the Cold War better, I would argue, than the NATO, alli NATO alliance. So where do we go? I believe that the, it is the foundational belief in representative democratic government that is truly the most common, most powerful common value between the United States and Japan. Now, democracy has historically longer roots in the United States than in Japan, where it did not gain influence and support until the 1920s, and then was completely derailed by the military nationalistic regimes of the 1930s. However, following World War II, the United States imposed a democratic form of government on Japan that that country proved to be very ready for and which has proved to be durable and resilient. But if my remarks this afternoon have made any point, it is that similar concepts in Japan and the United States can have far different appearances and democratic values are no exception. Since 1955, a single political party has held power in Japan, except for one brief and recent period. Politics often seem hereditary in Japan. The current prime minister is the grandson of another, and Japanese political family dynasties go far beyond the Clintons and the Bushes, about which Americans are so recently concerned. However, the elements of representative democratic government are still present and functioning in Japan and in the United States. Free and fair elections, individual rights, an independent judiciary, a vibrant and contentious press, an honest civil service that provides government services competently, political parties that react to popular opinion and aspirations. And Japan, perhaps more than the United States, values shared sacrifice, voluntary, not coerced, commitment to work for the greater good, an ethic without which democracy cannot flourish. So over the years, as the United States has been involved in has been involved in Asia at many different stages, from wars in Korea and Vietnam, through long phases of peace, with great political changes in Asia in countries such as the Republic of Korea, China, Indonesia. The United States has continued to feel both a strategic confluence of interest and a confluence of values with Japan. And Japan, for its part, has not only relied on the United States for defense support, but has shared the preference for democratic representative forms of government a strong private sector, and for working most closely with a country that shares those values. So, wh so what of the future? What is most exciting to those of us who work at Sasakawa USA is that the U.S.-Japan relationship appears on the verge of what could be one of its most vibrant and positive stages in its history. For the past 20 years, the relationship has been fundamentally strong, but in many ways moving sideways. Japan's economy has been stalled. Its role in international affairs has actually diminished. The United States has, many, has tried many different approaches to the security environment that followed the end of the Cold War, some of which have succeeded, some of which have not. We went through a major recession of our own making, from which we are only now beginning to emerge. But now things are changing. Japan is taking vigorous action to reignite its economy. There are mixed opinions about whether the actions of the first two years of Prime Minister Abe will produce the desired results 
But there is no doubt that Japan's leaders will keep actively pushing new approaches to seek to break out of the past doldrums. The United States is emerging from its recession, and the foundation for future growth seems solid. Japan has committed itself to a new national security policy, which Prime Minister Abe calls proactive contribution to peace. And Japan is moving out with diplomatic, economic, and military initiatives to play a much stronger role in the world. It is taking early steps to put more balance into that treaty relationship, that unequal treaty relationship with the United States. And in the United States, the upcoming 2016 presidential election promises to include, for the first time in many years, a strong and very discussion of national security issues. What are the threats? What are the opportunities? What allies can we count on? And I have no doubt that out of this situation will emerge a U.S.-Japan relationship that is e even stronger than in the past, that will serve as the foundation for policies that benefit not only both our countries, but also East Asia and other regions of the world. In the recent past, much, I would say too much, of the security dialogue between the United States and Japan has been about our relationship with each other, issues having to do with the basing of U.S. forces in Japan or narrow bilateral economic interests. I believe now that we have a chance to move on to big issues that are not only important to our two countries, but can make a difference in the East Asia region and further. Prime Minister Abe will be visiting the United States later this month, the first official visit by a Japanese prime minister in about a decade, and will be ad addressing a joint session of Congress during his stop here in Washington. And I hope that the impetus from his visit will overcome the last few obstacles in the way of U.S.-Japan agreement on the terms of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP, that TPP that will set the framework for international economic relations for 11 more countries very quickly, and many more, hopefully including China, in the longer term. It will establish the rules for, international, for an international economic system that favors the very best practices in areas like the environment, labor practices, state-owned enterprises, many others. And also in connection with the Prime Minister's visit, the two countries will undoubtedly announce a new set of bilateral defense guidelines, the first since 1997. And the primary changes from, from past agreements will be in the role of Japan. While Japan is not about to become an aggressive wielder of its advanced military force, it will modernize the U.S.-Japan defense concepts in many important ways to meet the demands, the challenges of the 21st century. From the Japanese point of view, Japan will have a greater ability to support its interests in a more equal partnership with allies like the United States. And for the United States, there will be a commitment from Japan to work together in new situations that threaten our common interests. In a world in which few of our traditional allies seem interested in events outside their borders, and most are decreasing their military expenditures, I think it's good to have a partner that is thinking how to do more and is actually increasing the resources to do it with. And with these two important achievements nailed down, which I hope they will be shortly, it's time for the United States and Japan to get to work in other areas. We can cooperate to support the early democratic transformations in many countries of the world, Myanmar, Sri Lanka, for example. We can work to support that progress in countries that are headed in the right direction, Indonesia, or need to be put back on the right path, Thailand. We can even we can even work on China eventually becoming a more democratic country. In the near term, we can cooperate on supporting China's entry into the world economic system in efforts to bring it into dealing with regional challenges in the Middle East, with North Korea, for example. We can deter Chinese newfound power from being misused for territorial gain on a unilateral basis. And we can challenge China to move in a democratic direction, a direction that will be necessary to unleash its, its full potential. The United States and Japan can cooperate in the area of energy, dealing with climate change. There's a full range of important objectives impo important to both China, or excuse me, to both Japan and the United States, and many of them to China, that can be achieved by a shared vision, closer cooperation across a full range of ep economic, diplomatic, and other spheres. So I think this cherry blossom 2015 is a marvelous chance to look back at the U.S.-Japan relationship 
and to value the many cultural ties between the countries developed over the years. And it's also a tremendous opportunity to think about the future of the Alliance and to commit ourselves to new possibilities, new promises. Thank you very much, and why don't we take a few minutes to uh, see if there are any last thoughts or questions, uh, and we also have the panelists earlier who can, who can answer them. But those are the only things that stand between you and the next thing on your schedule, so. In that case, I wish you all a wonderful Cherry Blossom Festival, a, a great spring, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.